Hey, Matthew, thanks for taking time to talk today. Sounds like you're in the middle of a storm out there. 100%. Yeah, thanks for being on the call. Appreciate it. What's going on in Idaho today? Well, it's been a crazy month and crazy year, but feeling blessed. We had a couple storms come through and we had a couple sub zero, uh, you know, winter storms come through as well. But right now we're just getting all the last, last winter snow coming down. And so, you know, right before this, I was telling you about how I was clearing off my dish to make sure my internet was coming through clear for this <laughs> recording. I love it. I know I grew up in a small town in Vermont, so I know what that's like with like power cuts and heavy storms and everything. When I was growing up, we would sometimes go days without power. And my mom, we would just have buckets of water sitting in the bathtub and she was always ready. Um, and we had wood stoves and all that. So we were fine, but <laughs> And I saw, awesome. I like, I like following you on LinkedIn. I'll have to put your LinkedIn in the notes, but I really appreciate how you're just really open and transparent about like your life there and your family and kind of the, the, um, the balance you seem to find. I don't know. You can tell me if there's balance or not just in, you know, the industry we're in can re be really intense. Um, but there's things that we do in our life to kind of maintain that just sense of wellness and health and fitness. And I know you have a farm as well. So how did you get into what you do? And you could just say like, what do you do? And, and kind of how, how do you find that sense of balance with other things going on in your life? 100%. Yeah. And I love how you mentioned that this is a really competitive type of business space to be in the whole CPG world. And so um, you know, I really respect what you do with Cirilla because uh, being a brand in this space is it's one of the toughest things I've I've ever experienced. I mean, I've been in other industries, everything from marketing to dental to, you know, fitness, you know, uh, <clears throat> tech industry a little bit. I've been a little bit in everything. Uh, and this space, there's just something about it that's so competitive. I don't I don't know why. I mean, it's partially because it's it's a foundational thing. Everybody needs food. So, um, you know, basic needs. So I think everybody's trying to get into it, but uh, it's really, it's really tough, really competitive. So um, cheers to you still, you know, moving in the space because a lot of people tap out pretty quick. So, um, but <laughs> as far as balance goes, <clears throat> yeah, I think balance is a weird thing. And I think I'm constantly learning about that. Uh, recently, actually, I, I've been really kind of understanding what my purpose is in life. I've, I've, I've been praying about it a lot and trying to understand like, why am I here? You know, and uh, you know, our company, natural brokers, we have a statement. We believe sustainable brands can change the world. So we help brands like yours that are natural organic get into stores nationwide. And, you know, that's what we're about is we're trying to get the right product in front of the right consumer. So they're not buying trash. They're not top, you know, pouring toxins into the earth. Um, organic is huge. I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest things, things out there. Um, but going back to the, the balance thing, you know, I, I, uh, I recently, so you've done a Ted talk, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. I watched it. Everybody watching too. You should definitely check out uh, Sarah's Ted talk. It was epic. Yes. Um, but I just made it through like the first phase into potentially getting into a Ted talk. So now I'm going down doing like the second presentation part. Yes. Um, so that it was weird when it came in. Cause I kind of, I put in my application, you have to put in a video and then uh, I forgot, I, I didn't really forget, but it was like, you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, I don't really care. I'm like, right. I'm throwing, I'm throwing eggs out, you know, trying to make things happen. Mm -hmm. um, and late one night I got, I got the message back saying, Hey, you made it through our first phase, you know, um, here's phase two, show up at this place and um, do the same application. Here are the things you need to do. And right when that came, my brain kind of clicked and it, 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 cause I've always wanted to do a tech Ted talk, <clears throat> but one of my issues was, is like, like, why am I doing a TED talk? What's the point? You know, because I've got some good mission statements for the things I do, but there wasn't the essence of who I am coming out. And mm -hmm. that ties into this whole balance thing is like, I realize what my purpose is, and it's to be essentially sustainably sovereign and to be an autonomous individual. So I want to be able to do everything that I can without the reliance on others. And so uh, that it just hit me like a brick. Like, that's that's why I'm here. That's I'm here to like not only embody that and be that myself but to teach others how to do that and so that ties into the balance thing because i think you need balance to accomplish whatever you're set out to do and so 
Um, you know, you mentioned fitness a little bit. That's a huge thing for me as far as balance. I, it's a moment to stop the, the hustle and bustle and just kind of, you know, put myself in a raw, you know, physical state where, uh, I have to just be alive. And so it, it takes me out of my right? thinking. Jiu-jitsu is a big thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. MMA. Um, so I've yeah. got some, some buddies in the LinkedIn community that we roll jujitsu and we do MMA and, um, mm-hmm. so we do striking and everything. And I've done martial arts since sixth grade middle school. So it's been a, a bit, big part of my life, but now it's, it's less of like, a uh, it is still a passion, but when I say it's less of a passion now, it's more of a lifestyle. Like I need to do that in order to step into work and be the best businessman I can be to step into my marriage, be the best husband I can be to step into Excellent. fatherhood, be the best father I can be, uh, so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, I think Agreed. the balance yeah. is, is so. Mm-hmm. Definitely. What is it about jujitsu or MMA that is so, I guess, puts you in that place? Is there like, cause my husband does jujitsu too. And it's, he loves it, loves it and loves starting his day that way. Like early morning, it kind of sets him up for actually, I think being really peaceful during the day because he's gotten that out of his system. I don't know what it is. What, what is it for you? Yeah, it's interesting. And, and props to your husband for doing it. Jiu-Jitsu is a, it's a hard, a hard thing to do, but it's very rewarding. And right now Jiu-Jitsu has got the world by storm and I understand why uh, I did striking all my whole life. So I did like boxing, Korean boxing, Korean, you know, Taekwondo type martial arts system, et cetera. Um, I did that for most of my life. And then I stumbled upon jujitsu a little bit later. And uh, one of the things I pulled specifically from jujitsu is the the way that they train. Most of the training you do when you're in jujitsu is live rolling for the most part. I've been to a couple of gyms where it was more uh, technique and then the live rolling was like the last 20 minutes. Yeah, they um, but, the, but the gym that I go to here, which I think kind of embodies what jujitsu is about it's, it's mostly live rolling. You go over a little technique, you drill it, and then boom, you're live rolling a little bit more technique, boom, you're rolling. And so there's something about where, you know, if another opponent is trying to choke you out or knock you out or whatever, um, and obviously you, you don't go so hard where you're trying to hurt your opponent. Um, there's, there's, you find that fine balance where you're not trying to hurt each other. Um, but it, it emulates life or death really. And so there's nothing quite like it, in my opinion, as far as like, especially fitness, um, there's nothing that can put you in that zone of like, I have to put, I don't, I don't have a choice. If I don't put hundred percent in, I'm about to get choked out. And so Sounds uh, like CPG. That's, that's why I think it's, it's like CPG. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, they're related for sure. It's very similar. Just like, we don't, we have a little more time, like to just determine what our next move is. <laughs> Yeah, you have to make some quick pivots. And I'm sure you're experiencing a lot of that. Uh, and it is it's I mean, it is life or death. I mean, if you if your business doesn't make it everything that you put into it, like, uh, I don't know how you don't look at that, like I just wasted everything, you know, so <laughs> I think it does force you to be like, I'm 100% in. Um, so so yeah, it, they're totally related. Well, congratulations on getting to that next step with your TED talk. Um, that's amazing. Where where's the TEDx? going to be held Spokane, Spokane, nice. Washington. So okay. yeah, right. we'll see. I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm, I'm hopefully optimistic. Uh, I think I've found like, as I said, my purpose. So I think when I get out there and I, I communicate it and refine it, I'm having people review all my, that's awesome. Well, I mean, I'm confident. yeah, what you shared sounds it's, it's gotta be a big idea. That's what Ted always asked for is they want someone to be presenting. And what you just shared sounds like a very big and, and and maybe even controversial idea, which is good. Like the more controversial, the better, right? Um, People like to debate sort of what's presented at a Ted talk. So can't wait. You'll be on stage. I'm excited. Can't wait to see it. Um, Yeah. I'm hyped. So I want to be sure if there are other CPG founders, like number one, they know where to find you, but also just a little backstory on, I know prior to this and and maybe like, what's your sweet spot, you know, working with brands like Cirilla. Oh, but first I just wrote this out. I don't know if you can read it. It might be backwards. New placement, super one and natural grocers. Go Matthew, go. Congratulations. Yes. No, that's super. I'm I'm excited. 
really huge. And let's talk about like how we got started um, just a few months ago, really with Cyrilla. And I think we originally connected on LinkedIn and just that the process of you getting Cyrilla into these two awesome chains. Um, and if you want to back up to 2020, even I know that was probably a, a really um, life-changing period for your business even because you were doing mainly demos prior to that, right? Yeah, exactly. So we did start off um, local demo service is another name more commonly known by um, natural brokerage is our you know, parent corporation. Um, but yeah, we, and we had the same mission statement, you know, we believe sustainable brands can change the world. So we help those brands, you know, get into the consumer's hand. That's our goal. And so, uh, 2015 is when we, November, 2015 is when we officially like legally launched our business before I was a contractor. And, uh, we started off in Hawaii. We were working with all the Hawaiian seal of quality brands. So anything grown in Hawaii, Hawaii is the least sustainable place on the planet. Believe it or not, they import 90% of everything consumed, which is really bad. So supply chain issues happen three days, they'll be out of food um, and there will be riots and gangs and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but fast forward doing demos, uh, we were offering brokerage. We helped our, even our first brand was uh, Rusty's Hawaiian Coffee, um, their Hawaiian coffee grower in Ka'u on Big Island, South of Kona. And um, we were doing brokerage for them. So getting them into stores, we were working with some other local brands here. So there's a brand in Missoula, Montana called Shive Light. We were doing brokerage for them. Uh, Defiant Coffee, we still work with them today. They're like a mushroom coffee brand, um, really cool brand. They're based in Post Falls, Idaho. And so we were offering that before, but it wasn't our main thing. Um, but yeah, COVID hit. Uh, naturally, we couldn't do the demos anymore. So at that point, I was like, well, I got to switch gears. So uh, we put everything into the brokerage and we've been scaling it up for the past, I guess, three years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that led us to eventually connecting with you and uh, Cirilla. Uh, I always thought your brand looked super cool. And um, it's, it's interesting when I look at some of the brands I work with nowadays, cause I was like, when I first saw you, I was like, well, this is a cool brand. Like they look like they're doing big things and it's hard to tell where people are at on LinkedIn, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so eventually when I started working with you, I was kind of like reflecting on that thought I had, you know, back mm -hmm. then I was like, huh, I'm like working with this person now, this is interesting, you know, cause, mm -hmm. cause you definitely like, like come across like a big shot on LinkedIn, um, in a good way. So I was like, I was like, cool. I'm working with this, like this really cool brand and I'm working with Sarah. This is awesome. Um, so, so yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you didn't and, realize I, you, you know, didn't we, realize I was ahead of like 10 departments, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Running the whole show. So, so yeah. And it's been, it's been awesome working with you. Um, you know, I think we're about four, almost five months in more or less. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're hitting it big with UNFI. UNFI is a hard thing getting into, um, in the first place. And then once you're in, there's the whole battle of, you know, ensuring you have enough sell through, um, cause they want to see X amount of units sold per week. And, uh, that's, I think one of the hardest things for brands, like, um, even getting in is super hard, but then once you're in, that's when the work starts. <clears throat> so, you know, we've, we've learned a lot about, uh, the, the DCs that you're in, which, you know, three of the ones we're working with right now are the Ridgefield, the Rockland and the Aurora DC. And so, um, we're making some headway. We've got some, uh, you know, co-ops, some one-off accounts, some independents ordering, and then we got those chains you announced ordering now too. So um, natural grocers, we just got the word this morning that we're like officially in the system. They can order. Um, so all of their buyers have our information now. Um, now it's just a matter of, you know, going into the stores, talking to the buyers. Um, so like tomorrow there's an event at Huckleberry's chain, um, which if anybody knows Huckleberry is part of Rose Hours. Um, on my way down there, there's three uh, natural grocers on the way. So you can be stopping nice. in those and talking to the buyers and, um, and then super one's a really cool chain too. They've got, uh, 12 stores, six in Idaho, six in Montana. Um, and then Rose hours, the state, the chain I just mentioned that owns Huckleberries, they own some super ones in Washington. So eventually, mm -hmm. you know, we'll be heading that direction too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great combination too. Um, cause I think, you know, part of our goal, and this is kind of a hot topic in like natural food industry in general is accessibility, right? And so like we we want as many people as possible to have access to Cirilla, um, no matter where they live. And then, you know, of course there's an issue of, of price accessibility too. So over time, I mean, the more we sell, the more we can create more competitive pricing um, because our volume can help drive down our pricing. So that's the goal. Um, because I think everyone needs to have access to 
healthy food and drinks. 100% agreed. So thanks for making that happen. I'm excited um, for those accounts. And I think you made a really good point, like just getting in, whether it's a distributor or a retailer, just getting in is just the start of the work really. And I know you've really been hustling to get those accounts, tons of follow-up, right? It's like lots of calls, lots of emails, lots of stopping by FaceTime. It does take time. And I guess for any, any brands working with brokers, I mean, I think sometimes you guys get a bad rap, like there's a lot of different types of brokers out there. Um, and so I was glad, you know, that we connected because you are one of the different types, I think, and you're really, you know, getting in the store on the fact that you have a background in demos and merchandising. That's so important because we need to have that demo support and merchandising um, to make sure that we've got the right placement, we've got the tags up, we've got people sampling in the stores because we owe it to the retailers. They're taking a chance on us. And now we have to do whatever it takes to be successful and to make sure that we get the sell through, um, whether we're on the shelf or hopefully in the coolers. But we often we often start on the shelf because we are a shelf stable product. And then if we do well enough there, then hopefully we'll get that cooler space. Right. Yeah. And that goes back to that whole uh, scrap and, you know, putting 100% in. I think that's people think that if they're going to go into this whole CPG space, they've got a great idea. You know, it's just going to, they're going to get a package. And once they can get product, then they're just going to get it on all the shelves and it's just going to sell. But that's the, the unfortunate reality is it's, it's a heck of a lot more than that. And I think even just that one step you mentioned right there, where it's like, you know, for your beverage, you know, Cirilla does great in the grab and go fridge, you know, that's where it's going to sell the most. Um, but to get it on the shelf, a lot of times you're going to have to land the shelf stable, you know, the dry shelf first. And that's even more like competitive in, in the sense that uh, once you're on that shelf, there's a lot more brands there versus the grab and go fridge. There's only, it's a smaller subset. So, you know, if they see 50 brands on the shelf there versus a hundred on the other shelf, there's less competition for what's being grabbed off the shelf. So, you know, people don't realize that like, okay, sure. You get into UNFI, that's step one, which is really hard. And then step two, you get into a small subset of stores. Okay. That's, that's another really hard step. And then step three is okay. Well, we're on the shelf, but we're not moving. Even if you have the best product in the world, it doesn't matter. You know, your product needs to move. And if you're a new brand, nobody knows who you are. Then it's like, okay, now we've got a whole new challenge. Like how do we get it to move? Um, and then hopefully you get to that grab and go fridge, um, you know, and you get to that point where you're in enough stores in one area where people are seeing you everywhere and then product starts to move. So yeah, lots of, lots of little challenges. I almost see the shelf as a waiting room now <laughs> when I go into stores, it's like, it's like this long, uh, hallway <laughs> and we're all vying for that, you know, back to your jujitsu and like getting in the ring. It's like, well, there's different rings. Like we want to be in that cooler ring. And then even when in the coolers, there's different levels, you know, there's this sometimes a cooler next to the register, which is awesome. Or, you know, there's one brand really cool, uh, urban remedies. I just, heard her interviewed on a podcast and they've got these allocated kiosks now in Whole Foods. It's an end cap cooler kiosk just for their brand, which is amazing. That's a great opportunity. Um, so yeah, there's different levels within the store. And then, I mean, as a brand owner in beverage, I'm always, I'll go down that hallway, like the waiting room of beverages. And you can see like it, it kind of breaks my heart. Sometimes there's brands that they'll slowly either get like moved to the bottom or slowly move to the top. The top shelf is sort of the kiss. Of, it's either the kiss of death or it's the backstock, which isn't a bad thing. It's either like a great brand that they just have so much um, backstock there and it moves so quickly. It's up there, but it, it you can, you can kind of tell who's about to go. Right. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I think that's a great concept, though, the waiting room. You know, you can almost have just a whole discussion on that. <laughs> and I think that's symbolic, not only of CPG in itself and, and you know, what it's like to be on the shelf initially, 
um, but also just as a, a entrepreneur and business owner who's trying to actually become successful, there's this long, long wait before you really start seeing a return. And it's a lot longer than most people realize. And uh, I'm reading a book called Endure by Cameron Haynes. He's a, okay. an amazing hunter, arguably the most famous hunter in the world um, at that this generation. And that's called Endure because, you know, his the whole concept is is just waiting it out and continuing through the pain and suffering until one day, you know, you finally are seeing the fruits of your labor. And um, I think that's really what it takes to be successful at anything is you have to wait. Um, and waiting is not fun. And it's hard. It's especially hard in entrepreneurship because you're looking at your revenue like, okay, how am I going to make it next month? Can I pay my employees next month? You know, you're getting really close at not missing payroll or whatever you're struggling with. Um, and is this expired product going to expire before I can get it out? Am I going to waste, you know, tens of thousands of dollars or whatever? Um, so there's, there's all this like potential for anxiety and, and, and all that while you're waiting. Um, but mm -hmm. I think the, the gold is made in, in that waiting process for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's back to, I know I keep tying it back to jujitsu, but it's also about pacing, right? Cause if you go too hard, too fast in the ring, like people just like they die before the rounds even over not die, but like they burn out or they tap out. Um, so a lot of that is just learning how to breathe through the discomfort and like staying calm under that pressure. And yeah. Okay. So we have a couple topics for some other conversations <laughs> in the ring, yeah, in good. the hallway. Um, well, I wanted to touch base on an announcement I saw yesterday on LinkedIn, the founder of Liquid Death, I'm sure you saw it and their new marketing campaign around their new tea, the canned tea. And I saw they just launched on Amazon, like maybe 24, 48 hours ago. So it's hot news and they're already like top selling RTV tea on Amazon. So someone might think like, that's hugely disappointing to me or scary. I think it's awesome because I think I've been building this new category for a few years now, and it's been slow. Um, I haven't had a ton of, you know, I've been bootstrapping, so I don't have the same kind of funding base as they do yet. Um, but I think it's really exciting that a big, really fast growing brand is coming in and helping us shape this category we've been trying to do with only a couple of other brands that are also pretty small up until now. So I think this is a huge opportunity for us because it's going to help retailers create new space in the store for this sparkling tea category. That's like an alternative to alcohol. And I, even though like the liquid death brand and the, the whole vibe is like completely different from Cirilla, it's almost like we have dark and we have light and like, maybe there's not going to be a lot of crossover in the consumer base there, which is, which is cool, but it's going to help kind of bring light to the category. What are your thoughts? I agree a hundred percent. I think competition is so important and I've got a good story about, uh, back when I was doing demos on Oahu, I had a, a brand that I still occasionally talk to. It's a really cool brand. I love, I love the brand. They're called tiny Isle Kauai. They do macadamia nut butter and uh, chocolate trebles that where the, uh, ingredients are predominantly grown in Hawaii. So they're a Hawaiian seal of quality brand. Um, and the thing about the macadamia nut butter, which was amazing. I, I was, I was like pampered by them. Um, I would get jars of macadamia nut butter every week. And so I just get to eat these cause there was too much to sample. Um, so I'd just be living off macadamia nut butter. Um, but anyways, we, we had them in the whole foods out there on Oahu and it, there people didn't understand the concept of macadamia nut butter. And, you know, I would explain, okay, it's, it's the same thing as peanut butter or almond butter. It's just macadamia nuts, you know, and <laughs> they still couldn't understand that. And I was yeah. like, I, I try to think of a million different ways to do it, but it still just wasn't registering enough. And we performed really well at demo. So we, we would sell a lot. Um, but I went to the brand. I had found another brand on Big Island that had macadamia nut butter too. Um, so Tiny Isle Kauai was from Kauai. Um, and then this other brand is from Big Island. And I was like, hey, so I'm I'm loyal to you guys. So I, I want to explain my 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 thoughts on this. So I've got this other brand here. I can broker them into Whole Foods on Oahu, right? And and the down to earths is another chain out there. I was like, 
I know it sounds like I might be like competing with you and like, there's only so much space, but I, I noticed that a lot of people just don't understand. So I think if we bring another brand in here, we get a little bit more shelf space for macadamia nut butters in general. I think you're going to see sell through increase. And mm -hmm. at first they were a little hesitant towards it. I kind of kept at it and kept responding to them. And eventually they're like, okay, you know, go ahead. And so I reached out to this other brand. Um, they signed up. I brought them into the Whole Foods and the Down to Earths. And then now we had two macadamia nut butters on the shelf. And so, um, and I would demo both of them. And since I was demoing macadamia nut butter so much more frequently, and there's only so many people on the islands, you know, Oahu has like a million people um, and, and you only have so many people shopping at those Whole Foods and Down to Earth. So you see the same people. Um, eventually we started seeing sales just like go up like crazy. Um, and so they, you know, I think they like 4X their sales without demos. So just sitting on the shelf by getting that other brand there. So I think competition is so good. Uh, I also think that there's just, there's enough, fish in the sea, so to speak. So if, if you get in that mode where you're like concerned about your competition, I think that's when you start to lose. I think you need to just trust in the process, keep going, you know, and if, if other competitors come out, it's, as you said, it's just going to bring more light to your category. Yeah, that is such a good example. It's a perfect example, really. Um, I, I really appreciate that. And yeah, I think if someone's really worried that like, a new competitor is going to put you out of business or something, then the product is not that good. Or, you know, the foundation isn't that strong. Like you've got to be stronger than that. Um, and it also makes me think of my husband's in real estate and just, you know, they, they're always doing comps, right. Um, you know, and so when a really valuable brand comes in, they help increase the value of the category. And so, um, I think if, unfortunately, if there's a brand in the same category and it's like one of the only ones and it's not selling well, unfortunately, the, the buyer in the, re, in the store may determine it's the category that's not a big driver for them and they're not going to bring in other brands for that category. So yeah, I think it's a good thing. I think uh, we can ride this wave of the new emerging sparkling teas in a can and um, I'm excited. I'm glad you've got all these strategies in place and so much experience, Matthew. And um, thanks for sharing that book you're reading too. I need to check that out, Endure. Okay. Is there anything else um, you want to share about, I guess, just tuning into like the hardest part about this business and maybe the most rewarding aspect of it? We kind of started out that way um, because I, I do think it comes back to like the mindset self-care, having a big why, knowing your purpose. What else? Yeah, I think, um, and we'll, we'll tune back into that book endure. I think it's all about enduring and uh, being willing to grow, you know, like this is, it's not going to be easy if you're getting into this space or you're already in this space, it's not going to be easy. It's going to take time. You're going to run into issues you weren't accounting for. Um, there's another guy, his name is slipping my mind, but uh, he talks about how in business, <clears throat> a lot of times entrepreneurs, they'll jump from one business to another um, because I think a lot of times it gets hard. And so they're trying to find the easiest path in, which in some regard is smart. But uh, once you develop a business, you kind of come up with a brand, you come up with a company culture, you know, you learn a lot, you become more of an expert in it. So even if you're failing a lot, it's a lot like, you know, a boxing match or a jujitsu match in where, you know, you get into the ring, you know, somebody's throwing punches and uh, you get hit, you know, and when you get hit, your eyes water up, you kind of swell up and you're like, oh man, I don't want to fight anymore, you know? Um, but you, you, if you get back in the ring, you endure, you know, you get in, uh, you might get hit again, same way you get hit again. Um, but your body toughens up to it a little bit more, a little less tears in your eyes. Okay. That punch comes a third time. Boom. You slip it, you know, you're underneath. Now, now you pass that and you're moving forward again, you know, and you might get hit with that again, but you, you understand now how to slip it. So it's like, oh, okay, that's how I can, this is how I can fix this problem, you know, and then a hook comes and then eventually you learn how to slip that, you know? So there's, it's, it's all about just staying in there, going at it. It's going to be hard, but you'll get there someday and you'll figure out how to, how to make it work. So, um, yeah, I think endurance is, is really where it's at. Mm -hmm. That's a great analogy. Yep. It definitely builds resilience and things don't get easier, but they, 
it might feel easier after time because we have the systems and we know how to navigate. So thank you. Well, that's a great way to yeah. end. And how can people reach you if they want to learn more about your services? 100%. Yeah. So LinkedIn, I think is probably the best way. Just look me up, Matthew Kubik. You can see my name in the LinkedIn screen right there, I think, or it might be somewhere else. Um, and then our, our company website is localdemoservice.com. Um, it's pretty outdated, but we're working on updating it. So I'd say those are probably the two best places to check us out. And um, I think we're going to have some other social media channels up and stuff like that pretty soon. So nice. check me out on LinkedIn and we'll go from there. Yeah. And if any brands want to collab with Cirilla, uh, we're going to start doing demos with the local demo service as well. And we could share a table. Um, so if we have complimentary, like, a, a, you know, a snack that could go with the drinks, I'm looking forward to getting on board with that model. So thanks again, Matthew. I'll talk to you soon. 100%. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate your time.